everyone's favorite Pokemon. There's a, good, a decent amount of variety in there. So now we will move, move on to the second category, which is favorite regions. So basically, just to clarify, this is all the individual continents that have served as the worlds in Pokemon. So in Generation 1, you had Kanto. In Generation 2, you had Johto. I think Generation 3 was Horeb. And also in the Pokemon Coliseum series, you had Ore. And I can't be bothered to list them all. Basically, you get at my point, the individual worlds that all of the Pokemon games have started. And Sven, do you want to start this one? Yeah, basically, I'm just going to come right out and say it. Huge, huge hands-down weakness for the Sinnoh region. Because while Hoenn was the region that got me into the games, what really got me into the games was playing through Gen 4 in Sinnoh. Because I loved the Pokemon, and I loved the atmosphere. It also helped that there were actual realistic day, night, and weather changes. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair enough, and actually, I will say, I think Generation 4 was when they started introducing the technique I really liked. They started adding, like, different aesthetics to the um, towns to make them seem like separate communities and ecosystems, rather than just a slightly smaller collection of houses than a larger collection of houses, etc. Yeah, that was another that was in the aspect of it, because for once, the world actually did kind of look different. <laughs> I can't remember all the different towns on the hand, but you had the mining town, you had Volkner's town, which was that weird electric grid thing. And there was Snow Point, and I'll admit, I love snowy locales, so actually having a proper snowy locale in Snow Point was uh, a plus point for me. Heh, <laughs> point. I didn't, I didn't even <laughs> intend that pun. <laughs> So yeah, I can understand that Sido was the um, start of all the um, positive changes to the Pokemon world design, I think. So. Yeah, and they only got better with Generation 5. Well, I completely take the piss out of Generation 5 for some of the ridiculous Pokemon designs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. And actually, that kind of leads me into my own, own particular favorite. And to be honest, I will say now most of the people in the comments agree with me on this. And over is my favorite world, just because there is so much to see in it, and it's, I'm like, I know in hindsight a lot of them were just sort of graphics and pieces, but just stepping into Castel City for the first time, that fully realized 3D city with massive new skyscrapers towering all over you, that was an amazing treat in itself. The only thing I would have wanted in Pokemon Black and White was for all of the cities to be like that, not just the one, or at least one or two more. Yeah. I completely get you in that regard, and honestly, there is very little I can complain about when it comes to the world in Generation 5. I really wish Black City hadn't been such a disappointment, though, because you go, yeah. into, this, you go into this massive city and you get a city block with four square buildings. <laughs> yeah, that was my biggest disappointment. They hype it up so that, like, like you, you go to Black City, that's like the biggest city in all of it over. You go there and it's smaller than the dotting town. Yeah, that was possibly <laughs> one of the biggest disappointments in the entire game. <laughs> Yeah, hey, but like I said, otherwise, the world is really cool, because like Diamond and Pearl, like, every town had, like, its own different aesthetic, it had its own different atmosphere, and I just kind of like the little touches they made to the world, like, I like the fact that all of the gym leaders had additional jobs aside from the Pokemon gym, like, being a Pokemon gym leader, it was a privilege, but it wasn't enough to kind of, like, sustain your living, you did have to go and find your work elsewhere, so I think it was kind of a world that felt like... Pokemon was a big part of it, but if you wanted to, you could just basically live and have a normal career in it doing something else. Yeah, because straight off the bat, you have the first gym leaders who run a restaurant. Then the second one runs a museum. Then, who the hell was the third one again? Oh, Bird. I... He directed the art gallery. It granted the Pokemon world in that little bit more realism, so you can see, oh yeah, so that's how they would live in a world like this. So... That's why I kind of love Anova so much, because it felt like the first complete world to me. There are plenty of other elements in the older worlds I do like, but Anova was just sort of the one that just felt complete overall. It didn't feel like it had any dead zones, as it were. Yeah, I completely get you, and honestly, Sinnoh I like just for the nostalgia factor, because that was what really got me into <laughs> Pokemon. But overall, I would agree that technically speaking, and, well, technically from a story writing perspective, Anova is probably the best. Mm -hmm. There are the main two exceptions of the comments. Boy Hated Stone and brought up Johto, which I can honestly understand, it, especially with the revamp in having a part gold and soul silver. And 
He points out that um, it's more oriental themed in terms of its aesthetic. Like, um, you had like the Tin Tower, the um, Bellsprout Tower. I think you also had the Kabuki Theater as well. That... Yeah, the Kabuki Theater, which I will always remember from a Nuzlocke I watched with the uh, Kimono Girls absolutely wiping the floor with this guy's team. Oh. It's, a random, it's a random thing, but I will always remember that dungeon, so to speak, for that. <laughs> I think also Johto did introduce some elements like the railway and the radio tower. And it felt like more on a grander scale than the original world, so I guess that's why Johto does stick in the heart of some people as well. Roy also mentions the uh, memorable NPCs, citing Joey. <laughs> oh god. Given the mimetic status of some of the NPCs, I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, jeez. One thing I will say is that I do not miss the telephone feature. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kind of had the same thing in Generation 3, but thank God you didn't get calls from everyone all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I like the idea of re the fighting trainers, but I dislike the idea of them just suddenly going, Oh, by the way, I missed a chance to catch a rioter. I, I don't care, Joey. Stop calling me. I <laughs> Basically, I love the idea of refighting trainers, but I don't want their Twitter updates. <laughs> you know what? What would be hilarious is if, for, either for Pokemon X and Y or the next game, there's something go, Now in the Pokemon world, you can contact trainers with a cell phone, which now has a block feature. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be so pointless, but I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> or just to spite us, they can have it so that... You have a cell phone on which you get all their social media updates. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so they get through. This is a picture of me and Ranatow on the beach. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd get an alert every single time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. That would be like the ultimate fan disservice. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. And the, th and the thing is, with social media being what it is, I can almost see them doing that. <laughs> oh, jeez. Actually, what I'd also find really hilarious is that if you got something like the Pokemon equivalent of a Tumblr post where someone's going, I think the governor of the Johto region isn't doing their job properly. What say we march on the gates and... <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Pokemon social justice activists. There is a terrifying image for anyone who has explored Tumblr like I have. <laughs> I thought the social justice references were bad enough at Homestuck. <laughs> oh, dear. With that rather interesting term, um, I should also point out that the second upset is Mega Shadow Runner, who has mentioned the Hoenn region. And honestly, I can see why, because like I said, Hoenn was the very first region that I ever encountered, and it did actually have a lot of charm, despite following the basic, uh, here's another copy-pasted city in a different location. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it did have some little bits of variety here and there, like Four Tree City. It's like a location for Donkey Kong, really. It's a series of tree houses. You also... <laughs> You also had a uh, Moss Deep Space Center, which you've got to admit, that was pretty cool for a Pokemon Worlds. <laughs> yeah, it, it honestly was. And also, it's the only place where I do have to admit, one feature I really didn't like was the Pokemon Trader Fan Club, and you could get NPCs to start following you as well. I thought that was really cool, like an acknowledgement of how far you'd come in the game as well. I mean, I know it was incredibly pointless, but it was something that I really liked at the time. As yeah, that's all of the regions covered, so we move on to our next category. Rivals. These are, of course, the trainers you strive to beat, mostly because they're the ones who keep interrupting you on your journey out of nowhere and saying, hey, let's have a fight. <laughs> Good way of putting it. I'm going to go with an example that, to be honest, may be considered cheating because it's kind of iffy about whether or not he really counts as a rival, but I would go for N from Black and White. Oh, yeah. I can completely understand. That game was interesting because, strictly speaking, you had three rivals. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, you had Shien, you had Bianca, but N was the one I considered the rival in more additional sense since 
you know, I haven't really fought him a lot of times. He was the one who was basically trying so hard to challenge your worldview. What's actually kind of interesting about Eng is that the idea they go with his character is that he has a very childish mindset in that he only sees things as black and white. You see what they did there? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> kind of a very simple justice system. He doesn't understand why anyone could condone putting Pokemon in Pokeballs at all. He just he's like the Pokedex is something absolutely horrible. And the main progression with him is the idea that nothing's ever that simple, which is. I also think it's kind of interesting that they basically made him like a lot of people on the internet, I'm sorry to say. It's... You know, that's actually a point. He's basically a likable version of PETA. <laughs> and let me just say, I am so sorry for comparing Pokemon's greatest villain ever with PETA. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the difference is, though, is that eventually he kind of learns the other his ways and realizes that you do have to kind of see other people's point of view and nothing's ever as straightforward as just simple right and wrong. Yeah. And I know what you mean about the character development. That is going to come up in my answer, too. Int's character development really is... It's part of that expanded, more mature plot that made Gen 5 good. Yeah, and like I said, I know it's kind of cheating since it's debatable whether he counts as a rival, so if I couldn't have then, I think I'd probably go with the same choice Roy Havenstone did and say Silver, just because he was probably the most antagonistic rival from Pokemon Gold to Silver. Yeah, I could kind of see that, but to be honest, he was such a douchebag that it completely turned me off. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, I'm not saying he was likable, don't get me wrong, he was an absolute douche, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he... And so, and which rival would you pick? Well, I'm gonna kind of slightly cheat here because technically I shouldn't do doubles, but I'm just gonna go with Charon and Bianca from Generation 5. Huh. For the simple reason that I just really liked their character development. They are the player <laughs> character's best friends, but at the same time, they challenge you to become stronger people, if that makes sense. I can see where you're going with that. It's kind of interesting because Bianca's always trying to catch up to the other two, and Sharon's always, um, it's got, I don't know if he wants to be strong, but doesn't really have any good reason for doing it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and really, they have entire story arcs based on their contrasting motivations, and really, I just like seeing them go through that, like seeing Sharon finding his reason to fight, etc., etc. Hmm. I also um, kind of like the fact that Bianca is like, she's like the first rival to have like a really big emotional mode with its own music, you know. Also, let's not forget that Sharon did become a gym leader. I think he's the first gym leader you fight in black and white too, so. Yeah, so his story arc actually got him somewhere, and in fact, Bianca's did too, because she found something she was happy doing, being an assistant to a uh, Pokemon professor. Yeah, that's the term. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Generally, I just like their characters and the arts that they went through because that is my big thing when it comes to writing. I love characters. Characters make the story for me, and what can I say? As far as rivals go, they help make the story. Indeed. One rival that's mentioned by a lot of people in the comments is, um, well, it kind of depends how you call him. Most of the official names call him Blue. Other people call him Gary after the whole Pokemon anime. But yeah, basically the rival from Generation 1. And I can kind of see that because, again, it's partly nostalgia. Again, it's partly because he was more confrontational than other rivals. I mean, not as much as Silver. But Silver isn't so much confrontational as he is shoving your head against the wall. But <laughs> Yeah, because so, yeah, it's hard to get more confrontational than a rival that is an actual villain. <laughs> yeah. But he's one of the few rivals who actually made it to the champion. Like, you beat all the Elite Four, and he's the one who stands before you. He's the one who stands between you and the crown. He's always ahead of you, but in the end, you get your chance to really cream him right at the end. Yeah, and honestly, given who it is, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's one of the first few rivals who you can name, which unfortunately led him to um, some unfortunate parodies in recent years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was like one web comic. He was pointing out how silly it is that Professor Oak asks you, So, what's the name of my grandson? Oh, yes, douche, I'd always forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, firstly, um, Professor Oak, you may want to go get checked out for Alzheimer's. 
Secondly, I would really hope that not even you would believe me if I told you that your grandson's name was Dickbag. <laughs> the other two rivals that were brought up, uh, the Infinity Zero brought up Barry from Gen 4, which is kind of interesting, because again, that's one that doesn't top most of the list, mostly because his hyperactive nature was kind of uh, love him or hate him with most people. Yeah, and I'll admit, he was annoying in a Chugga Conroy at his worst sort of way, to put that in hopefully a way that makes it. And, but, yeah, it at the, but at the same time, he was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where you definitely can't fault him for enthusiasm, but sometimes it was a bit too much. <laughs> Yeah, like, practically every single meeting you have with him, he just slams straight into you out of nowhere, and you're like, Damn it, I just got done with the gym, let me get to the Pokemon Center. Yeah, and finally, 2Junkie1 also brings up, he doesn't quite remember the name of Pam, but I know which one he's talking about, which I can definitely understand, because admittedly his character art was very simple, he was a frail boy who caught a Pokemon and then through it gained the strength to go on his journey, but at the same time, you didn't really confronting much as a rival. It was only like one or two battles, but you really had to feel for the little guy. Again, I'm a sucker for underdogs, so I will admit, I really did like Wally as a cat. Yeah, I honestly completely agree with you there, because again, it's the underdog story, and he was generally just a really likable character. Mm -hmm. And so, with the rivals covered, we move on to the next series of Powerful Traders. In other words, what's our favourite gym leader stroke Elite Four member? For those of you who don't play the Pokemon games, and if you don't, I'm wondering why the hell you're listening to this right now, uh, the gym leaders in the Elite Fours are basically the bosses, essentially. The most powerful trainers you have to confront in order to progress through the game and the plot in some cases. So I could have put them as um, set separate categories, but I decided to dunk the Elite Four and the gym leaders into one because, well, they pretty much serve the same function, really. It's just that the Elite Fours are one very big boss squad. Yeah, and I'm really not sure if I can say right away if I have a favorite because, honestly, I'm not gonna lie, I like every single gym leader in Generation 5. But that's about the Fair only enough. generation I can say that of. And <laughs> it's really difficult to pick a favorite because, I mean, I liked Clay, I liked Skyla, I really liked Elisa. In fact, I may actually go with her because I liked Elisa's personality. I loved her gym, although I will admit the actual gym fight with her was a pain in the ass. Oh my yeah. god, the Amolgas! <laughs> yeah, it, well it wasn't so much the Amolgas, it was the fact that they also had Volt Switch, meaning you couldn't really hit them for long. Yeah, and then, oh god, that Death Striker right at the end. <laughs> but, I guess that's what gym leaders are there to do, challenge you, and I certainly got that out of it. Yeah. Not to mention if she's my favorite or whatever honorable mention, but I will say I really do like her a lot, especially since I really loved her gym in Black and White 2, because normally my strategy with the gym leaders is, okay, I beat up all of the other trainers in there to get experience, then I heal up and go over oh, the fight Elsa. But for those of you who never played Black and White 2, her gym is basically like, it's a model catwalk with like each of the various trainers in the spotlight. The music gets more and more exciting, like, the further you go oh, down, the more trainers you defeat. And then eventually, like, Elsa's standing right at the end. The music is fully blaring. She's right there in the spotlight with an LCD screen behind her. And you're thinking, okay, no, I can't oh, I'll go back. I have to go and do this now. <laughs> yeah, I still haven't played Black and White 2 myself yet. Money. But just imagining that gym just increases my appreciation. <laughs> yeah. If you ever do get a chance to play back in Y2, I, I will say that was one of my favorite moments in the game, that gym. It was just, oh, glorious. I'll keep that in mind, because that sounds awesome. Yeah. It's oddly enough, I kind of like Flannery for Generation 3, just because she was someone who'd become a gym leader, but pretty much had no idea how she was supposed to act, if that makes any sense. She tries to act serious, and then her final Pokemon is basically a camera up with a track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, I completely understand that, because of all the gym leaders in Generation 3, I think Flannery and Winona were my favorite. Yeah, Roxy was also an interesting case of going on Black and White 2, although admittedly, that may be purely because uh, she has her own rock band. 
Yeah, I gotta admit, I, again, I haven't played Black and White 2 yet, but I love that concept so much, especially considering that one of the members of her band is a reference to Green Day. <laughs> huh. I did not get that. <laughs> yeah, because I forget which member it was, but one of the members of the band is named Billy Joe, after Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Another what I vaguely like the concept was, was Volkner. It's got the idea that the gym leader who's so strong, he's kind of just grown bored of the concept of battling in general, so... Oh, yeah, and again, I agree with you there, because he had an awesome character design, for one, and then just the whole concept of him, he just doesn't give it anymore. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. This would be the part where I would name my favourite, but the problem is I'm constantly, at the moment, I'm dancing around the issue because there are several I like, but I couldn't really choose a favourite out of all of them. Yeah, that's exactly the problem I have because, again, I liked pretty much every gym leader in Generation 5, and it's not like I just liked all the rest of them either, so there is a lot to choose from. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to jump straight out of my iffy whiffy cop out answer straight to the people who were good enough to pick one. Starting off at the top of Roy Havenstone, and he picked Anne. He actually picks one I've just realized I also kind of like, so thank you for reminding me, Norman from Generation 3. Oh yeah, and I'm looking at his reasoning and I completely see why. I don't know why I forgot about Norman, because he definitely had character, he's your parent in that game. Yeah. Basically, for those who haven't played Generation 3, the concept behind him is that your family moved to the home region because he became a gym leader there, pretty much. And Yeah, and to quote Roy Evanstone, you get to prove yourself to your dad, and his defeat marks the halfway point of your journey to the Pokemon League. So, yeah, that was a pretty big deal when you finally got there. Yeah, I admit, that battle actually had something that not many other gym leaders can say because it was a major plot point in the story, like a very major specific plot point, like a very major battle in Fire Emblem, say. <laughs> hmm. Yep, that is true. I'll let you handle two junkies once. Yeah, he has Misty, and I can see why, and the reason is nostalgia. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, even if she had to be picked as one of the companions of the Pokemon anime, I think her design is fairly cute enough to get an appeal that way as well, I think. Yeah, and honestly, even discounting the Pokemon anime, Misty was way more memorable than Brock in the context of the games, too. Because once you reached Misty, it was just about the point you realized you were screwed if you picked Charmander. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> I think I had to grind through the Charmedia when I was younger in order to have any chance at that one. Yep, same whenever I played Pokemon Fire Red. <laughs> oh dear. Vice of Legends has an interesting pick with Cillian, one of the three brothers in the first gym of Pokemon Black and White. Honestly, this one's kind of odd because outside of the anime, there's not much to say about the dude. <laughs> Well, I think he, he got his personality expanded a little bit in Pokemon Black and White 2. I, I'm trying to remember if he was the Karma one or the Fiery one. He was the Grass one, the leader. I'm trying to remember the exact order of the scene, but you get the scene with them at the end of the game, and you find out that, um... Okay, to give you some context, in Black and White 2, they kind of come to the realization that they're pretty weak as trainers because they rely too much on the triple brother combination thing. Now, I don't know if it's Cillian who puts that forward, but... The other thing is that maybe we should focus on being stronger as individual trainers first. And what's also actually kind of interesting, there was actually a theory going around on some fans that those three gym leaders were the Shadow Triad in disguise. And when uh, Black and White 2 disproved it by the kind of inspiration for their decision to disband, if you will, comes from the idea that... The, wait... Well, the concrete truck running through their restaurant. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> the Shadow Triad suddenly appearing and then absolutely creaming them. And people were going, going oh, well, they just lied for out there. This Shadow Triad never had that balance. Like, Dude, what is with... <laughs> I mean, I oh, God, don't it's like, get... It's like, <laughs> it's like trying to argue with crackpot conspiracy theorists who think there's reptilians in the core of the Earth. Yeah, it's... 
I honestly don't get it. I mean, what, you wanted them to be evil transgenders? Okay, I don't know why, but... <laughs> I mean, like, there's nothing wrong with that, but what's the obsession? Yeah, like, it's kind of like, it's one of those breeds where it's trying way too hard to be clever, you know, it's even... Yeah, like, this is Pokemon, it's not that deep, even in the Innova games. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just a bit too silly on that front. But yeah, even ignoring that, I'd say, yeah, Sidian's kind of cool on that front, I would say. It, it's really interesting, because like I said, that's not one that tops many lists, I would say. So again, I could give someone kudos for going against the Norman one. <laughs> Moving on to Mega Shadow Runner, he mentions Wallace from Generation 3 before he became the champion. Yeah. Just in personal preference, I think he works better as a gym leader than a champion, but still, he was a pretty cool trainer, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, and I admit, I'm always one to appreciate the hammy characters, and if ever there was a ham in the Pokemon series, it was Wallace. Just look at how he dresses. <laughs> yeah, it was either him or Fortina, one of the t Oh yeah, oh god yeah. Cause then you have <laughs> ham on top of French. <laughs> I think she's like one of the gym leaders that has the most displaced nationality. It's either between her or Lieutenant Surge, who was just randomly proclaimed the Lightning American before we even knew America existed in Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Wallace is definitely a cool trainer, although he's Looney Colo's in Emerald. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Screw those and their double team forever. Yeah. <laughs> also, still, yeah. also, just before we move on from gym leaders, I just have to say, Lieutenant Surge, the Lightning American, and totally not the Lightning Guile ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we've got the Infinity Zero, who has mentioned Flint, the uh, Elite Four Fire member, I believe. And yeah, I kind of like him. For one, he was the one who got Volkner out of his bug to challenge you, or at least inspires you to do it. Yeah. And for two, again, it's the same thing as I mentioned regarding Barry. He is honestly entertaining. <laughs> yes. I mean, for, I mean, for starters, just look at that bright red fluorescent afro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also kind of like him because he's a Fire Pokemon user, and to be honest, Fire Pokemon users tend to get shafted a lot. I have times, but Fire tends to be treated as one of the least important types, oddly enough. I don't know why. I mean, I know they always get a starter, but... Yeah, it's a very undervalued and underrepresented typing, considering they're one of the starting... Considering fire types are one of the starting Pokémon types. Yeah, it's just pretty bizarre at that point. So yeah, full power of flint. I also did like it in Platinum. When you enter the trainer cafe for the first time, he basically forces Volkner into a double battle with you and Barry. <laughs> yeah, there's also that. I also liked that his battle in the Elite Four was kind of a breather because he was way simpler to take on than the last two Elite Four members you fought. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one was just a simple yeah. little power battle with some birds to worry about it. Yeah. Just by the by, never get me started on Eren in the Elite Four in Gen 4 ever. That <laughs> godforsaken Vespa Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. So yeah, that's the gym leaders covered, but of course, one trainer must stand above them all. Which conveniently leads us into favorite champions. 